I'm going to do something today that I've sometimes wanted to do, but I've never done before. I was thinking after I watched last week's video that if I've done my math right, in the 40 plus years that I've been involved in pastoral ministry, I've probably preached or taught or led a Bible study or in some way communicated uh, God's word probably 3,000 times or more. Now, I've always viewed myself as an ordinary, average, run-of-the-mill pastor. I'm not a great expositor. I'm not a great Bible teacher. I think that I'm like most other pastors in uh, in and around our country. We do the best we can with what we've got, and God uses that. I'm grateful for the fact that he uses us regardless of our abilities. I can't compare myself to some of the pastors that you may see on TV or listen to on the radio who just seem to hit a home run every time they get up to preach. For me, if I was done with my sermon or my lesson and I felt like I had communicated what I wanted to communicate, I would say that was good. Every once in a while, you go a little bit above that, though, and you you'd, uh, preach or teach in a way that just seemed to um, get people to respond a little bit differently, and you felt a little bit better about it. But the opposite is true also, that there were times when you got done, and this is true of other pastors I've talked to, we get done with our sermon or our, our lesson or whatever it is we're doing, and we think about it for a moment, and we may even listen to it if we have the opportunity, and we say, you know what, that was a real stinker. But people have gotten up and gone home, and there's nothing much we can do about it. But today, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to uh, take what we looked at last week, and um, we only spent about 15 minutes in this passage. I'm going to take it, and I'm going to chuck it, all right? And I want to look at this passage again, not because I'm bent on some way of of uh, making myself look better. That has nothing to do with it. I just didn't feel like I represented the passage as fully as I could have. And by the time I was able to check it out, well, it was too late to do something else and get it up on our website. So today we're going to be looking at the same passage we looked at last week, which is 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17. Now, before you say, oh, wait a minute, I heard it already, please don't tune me out because I've got new things to say not new things that I've invented from the passage, but I want to look at it differently. And so I hope you'll hang with me. Uh, hopefully, you won't come to the end of this uh, lesson and say, wow, if he thought last week stunk, he should listen to this one. Uh, hopefully, we'll be a little bit more complete and a little bit more compelling than last week. Now, let's read 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are not free. Excuse me, I messed that up. Live as people who are free, free not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God, honor the emperor. Now that's a paragraph that's brief and it introduces Peter's discussion on how we deal with authority in our lives. And he talks primarily there about government authority, but there are principles that I think are broader than that. There are really six different commands in this particular passage. In particular, Peter singles out the emperor and governors as people that we are to be subject to, submissive to, when he says we are to be subject to every human institution. And there are two reasons for our willing submission to authority. One is because of our relationship to Christ for the uh, Lord's sake, it says. And second, because doing good will silence ignorant critics. We'll see that a little bit later on in the passage. So that's the first one of the six commands. Then he says we're to live as people who are free, but at the same time we're not to abuse our freedom. That's the second big command. And again, we'll look at that too. And then he finishes the letter with four brief sentences uh, that also are commands. We are to honor everyone. We are to love the brotherhood. We are to fear God. And we're to honor the emperor. It's the second time he says that essentially in this passage. Now, the way that you and I apply verses 13 through 15, or really 13 through 17 in our world, is going to be different from the way that Peter's audience would apply them. 
Though there are similarities to some degree between our day and Peter's day, there are some significant differences. And so let's talk for a few minutes about Christians in government. Probably the most obvious difference between Peter's day in the first century and uh, our day is the system of government that he lived under compared to what we live under. In Peter's day, the emperor was supreme and was often an object of worship. He was viewed as a god. But you would no doubt agree that hopefully we have no one within our particular government structure who views themselves as being uh, supreme and uh, no one is looked at as being a god. In Peter's day, criticism of or opposition to the emperor could result in death or torturous prison. But in our day, it's like criticism of the government is, has almost become a, a sport. We say baseball is the national pastime. Well, I'm not sure. I think that criticizing politicians and politics has become the national pastime in a lot of people's lives. And uh, whereas criticizing the emperor in Peter's day would result in death. Um, in our day, there are rarely any consequences to the fact that we uh, are, disagree with what our government officials may do. Thirdly, in Peter's day, the only way to change the government was to topple the emperor. And that did happen from time to time throughout the history of the Roman Empire. And we, however, uh, in our system, voters can bring about change. And we see that in every election cycle, whether it be two years or four years, there are going to be some people that are elected out and other people who are elected in to office, public office. So when we compare Peter's day to our day, we see that there's some significant difference between the kind of government structure that they lived under compared to what we live under. So we ask the question then, how do we apply instructions given to, given to people in the first century to our day when our circumstances are so different. And Peter provides an answer in this past paragraph, I believe, when he tells us that we live good lives for the Lord's sake. We're to live good lives for the Lord's sake. And secondly, we're not to abuse our freedom. Those things were true for Peter's audience, and they're true for you and for me today in our particular circumstances. Now let's talk, talk about this idea of living good lives. Uh, that we find in verses 15 and 16. The main concern that he has here, if I read it correctly, seems to be reputation. Uh, both the reputation of Christ and those who uh, profess to follow him. Listen again to verses 15 and 16. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people, Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. So we're to live in a way that we can't be accused by the opposition, and we're also to live in a way that while we are free, and we'll define that in a little bit, uh, we are not to abuse our freedom. I grew up as the son of a policeman in northern New Jersey, and I don't ever recall my parents uh, telling me that I needed to think this way, but it was always part of the way that I evaluated what I could or couldn't do to think about the impact it would have on my parents' reputation, but especially my dad as a police officer in the town where I lived. Now, uh, I think my mom and dad are, are watching this, and so dad, that's the reason that I never robbed that bank there in Glen Rock. Um, as far as setting a fire in the woods across the street, that was just a moment of forgetfulness, so we won't dwell on that, okay? But seriously, I, I didn't want to do anything that would reflect negatively on my parents and especially my dad as a law officer in our community. And I think it's important that we think that way when it comes to uh, our relationship with God. Um, you're probably familiar with the name Ravi Zacharias. Uh, he was one of evangelicalism's most persuasive speakers, and uh, he did much in his writing and speaking to defend uh, the Christian faith and argue for uh, the truthfulness of the Christian faith and the integrity of the scriptures. Sadly, uh, there were rumblings before his recent death, and then after he died, the story came out that this man had been living a double life for a very long time. It's a common story of an alleged sexual predator 
who took advantage of vulnerable women. And this allegation, which was confirmed by his own organization after his death and was reported on both the, uh, in both the Christian and secular press, was just another black eye for the face of Christianity. And we've seen that happen all too often in our day. Now, I thought I would look for articles that allowed comments at the end uh, with reference to this particular situation with Mr. Zacharias. Uh, there's a lot of times when I've read articles and you know there are 100 people that make comments or more. But I, I had a little bit of a hard time finding an article that was open for readers to leave comments. But I did find one somewhat obscure blog. But nevertheless, the person has about 1,000 people who follow their blog. And uh, I thought that was sufficient. And he allowed people to post comments and responses to what he had said. And one response that I think is typical of many of those that I have seen over the years with regard to Christians and especially to Christians failing is this. One person said, Bible-loving folks like to talk about plagues, but they don't realize that evangelical Christianity is the plague on us or excuse me, on the U.S. Let me read that again. Bible-loving folks like to talk about plagues. I don't know whether or not that's true, but anyway, he says, they don't realize that evangelical Christianity is the plague on the U.S. And he goes on to say that the hypocrisy of the culture is legend. The hypocrisy of the culture is legend. Now, that's the response of an unbeliever to news that he heard about the behavior of someone who claimed to be a follower of Christ, who lived for apparently a rather long time in a way that when it was found out, he brought dishonor on the gospel, though that doesn't bother this guy. For him, it just illustrates the fact that that's the way those Christians are and the movement is filled with them. Well, sadly, the movement can be filled with them. Uh, there are many people who have failed, and many of our more well-known Christian authors and pastors and leaders have fallen in various ways, whether it be immorality or a lack of integrity with regard to finances or whatever. And every time it happens, Christianity gets a black eye. And the, what, what the... Um, the media considers to be evangelicalism is such a big circle that anyone who has any idea that the Bible is God's word or who uses the Bible uh, or who, who talks about Jesus Christ is kind of lumped in that category of evangelical. And so it may be someone that we look at as being um, not quite on target doctrinally or sometimes maybe way off doctrinally. But if they fail, if they fall, it will be a black eye on the gospel uh, and on the, uh, the Lord's reputation. I don't think that that's the impression that Peter wanted his readers to cultivate. If we read through this passage, it seems that it's quite obvious that he wanted them to cultivate a reputation that spoke well of the Lord and I'm assuming of the gospel and of them as followers of Christ. Now, unfortunately, Ravi Zacharias' failure was big news because of his celebrity. He was well known. He was on Christian radio. He wrote, I think, 30 books. He spoke extensively on college campuses and at different conferences. Uh, and I'm not going to evaluate where this man is in terms of whether he's in heaven or not. That's not my place. Uh, I am very disturbed when I read about a, a Christian leader who has this kind of moral failure and does not repent of it um, before they die. That does cause me to wonder. But that, that's really not the point. Uh, his failure was big news because of celebrity. But we are capable as ordinary people of causing the same response within our own smaller but still real uh, sphere of influence. We may be the kind of people that because of our particular behavior, and I'm not even talking about moral failure, but it may be that there's something odious about our behavior that 
people around us say, well, he claims to be a Christian. Well, if that's what Christianity is all about, I want nothing to do with it. Or they may just say, just like all those other Christians, hypocrites. And you've heard it said, well, the church is full of hypocrites. Yeah, in some cases that's true. The church contains people who are hypocrites and the church contains people who fail. And when they do, there's a ripple effect uh, to the lives of the other people that they know. But that's not the way we're supposed to act. And I don't believe that it's the way most of us act. But there's always that danger. And that's why Peter takes the time to warn his readers about the way that they behave. Because he doesn't want uh, a black eye against the gospel, especially at a time when the Christian movement was just starting to gain impetus and spread throughout the Roman world. Peter wanted Christians to live in a way that brought respect and honor to the name of the Lord. Now, he talks about freedom in verse 16. And let me read that again. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. What does he mean? I think we need to understand that when he's talking about freedom here, he's not talking about political freedom because the people in Peter's day were not politically free. They did not enjoy the same political freedoms and rights that we enjoy in the United States and in most of the West. So we have to ask ourselves, well, what is he talking about? Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. And as I thought about that, I was reminded of a passage, and there are a number of them that we could go to, but I'll look at this particular passage in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 20 through 23. Here we go. I'm getting there. All right, Romans 6, verses 20 to 23. Here we go. Follow along. For when you were slaves of righteousness, or excuse me, <laughs> when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of these things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit that you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, when you read through especially Romans 6, 7, and 8, you'll find this idea repeated constantly that there is a freedom that Christians have in Christ. Only it's not a freedom to do whatever we want. It's a freedom to follow Christ. It's a freedom that we did not have before we were believers because we had no power to follow Christ in a faithful and consistent way until we were brought into God's family and regenerated. If you're following the Root series, and I'd encourage you to do that, uh, we're going to be talking about some of those words in the next couple of weeks. But when Peter is talking here about not using your freedom uh, in a way that is, is wrong, not using it as a cover-up for evil, I believe that he's talking about the same thing that Paul is talking about. We are to live as servants, or probably the better translation is slaves of God. We were once slaves of sin, now we're slaves of God. And so which, which master are we going to obey? Are we going to obey our old master? of sin because we say, well, my sins have been forgiven and so I can do whatever I want. Or are we going to say, I'm going to obey God as my master because my sins have been forgiven and now I am free to follow Christ. See, when, when we come to Christ, we are freed from the penalty of our sin and progressively we, are, uh, we become more and more free from the power of sin in our lives, but we're never completely free of that and never will be until Christ takes us to heaven. So it's something we always have to battle. We always have to battle that nature to sin. And when it comes to relationships and the way that we look at other people, 
It is a very easy thing for us to fall into sinful patterns of behavior. And that's why Peter says, I want you to live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. Well, how do we do that? Well, I think he summarizes it in verse 17. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. And when you look at that, there is a sense of respect that I think goes all through that. You know what I mean? There's a sense in which when he says honor everyone, well, that word means to respect everyone. Everyone is made in God's image. And so we respect them. We may not like what they do. We may not like what people say, but we're to respect people who are made in the image of God. Secondly, we're to love the brotherhood. And love involves having respect for people. Third, we're to fear God. And that doesn't mean we're to be afraid of God and go cower in a corner and be afraid that he's going to get us. It means to have a sense of reverential fear, the same way that uh, we would treat perhaps a, an open electric socket, where we know that if we touch it, it would be to our great harm. We don't play with God. We have a sense of, of knowing that God loves us deeply, but at the same time, we don't take advantage of that and live in a way where we just kind of brush off what God says. We have a sense of reverential respect. But then he comes down again to this point that he kind of opens the paragraph with when he says, honor the emperor. Well, Peter, you've already told us to, to submit ourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor supreme or to governor. So why do you tell us this again? And I think the reason is probably obvious. Uh, if you're a parent and have a child, think, think about having a teenage child for a moment. It's, it's almost like just before you're about to leave for the day, you talk to your son or your daughter and you say, this is what I want you to do while I'm away. I want you to make sure that the grass is cut. I want you to pick up your room. I want you to m not make a mess in the house so that when we come home, we come home to a mess. And you better make sure the grass is cut. Now, you just said that a couple seconds ago, but why did you say it? To underscore its importance. And I think what Peter is doing is he's saying, you need to be subject to the emperor and to governors, and please make sure you do it. I think that's what he's trying to get at. Why does he say this? Because Christians faced difficulty from the Roman government. At various times and at various ways, the Roman government often persecuted Christians either in uh, different regions or over the whole of the Roman Empire. And I don't know about you, but when somebody treats me badly, that can lead to my having a very bad attitude toward them. It could lead to my perhaps wanting to ignore them when they say something to me. And Peter doesn't want that. Peter doesn't want them to ignore the authority that God has placed in our world to keep order. And so he tells them, we need to be slaves of God, and that means being obedient and honoring those that God has placed in authority. It means living a good life so that no one can look at us and say, see that guy there, see how he lives? Well, if that's a Christian, I don't want any part of it. It's to live in a way that we understand that we're free from sin's power, but we don't just say, well, my sins are forgiven. I can do pretty much whatever I want because that's not true. We're to live in a way that brings honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ because he's our master. Well, I'm back, but in a different location. I was unable to put this announcement on the video uh, when I finished recording the class that you've just watched, but I wanted to let you know what's taking place. The next two weeks, Dick Regal is going to be teaching. I know that many of you have uh, followed his teaching ministry, and you'll be glad to have him back. He's going to be teaching something of his own doing, and then following that, I'll resume our study in First and Second Peter. And so, Dick, thank you. I know that uh, the class will enjoy having you back, and I'll see you folks in another couple weeks online. I'll be here otherwise, though. Take care.